Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, let's wait for you. I've just had a webcam fitted to my car. Because, uh, oh, because, uh, well, because if you go on YouTube and you look at, uh, there's plenty of webcam footage of people crashing in front of you. There's very little webcam footage of people crashing, but lots of footage of people in front crashing. So I've managed to fit it on the basis that I'm unlikely to crash, but I might record some video that's helpful in the case of a, a separate crash. Plus, uh, I'm a great fan of CCTV where it's in the right places and a big uh, I'm a big opponent of it when it's not so I think uh, surveillance has, has been is a double-edged sword really you know it depends who's got access to the footage it's, it's a tool of mass surveillance of course but I mean really nobody it's not like someone in Whitehall can press a button and get access to this footage, so, um, you know, I suppose they could. They press the button and send the police around, then <laughs> they could, but, you know, not, not in the same way as they can through, uh, like, uh, town centre coverage or motorway licence plate coverage and that sort of thing. But anyway, that's not really what we want to, we want to talk about dentistry, don't it? Where are we with dentistry? What's the latest, you know? How's it going? How's it going with you? How's it going with you? Are you getting on all right? Yeah? My private practice is doing okay. We, we were very quiet. And then we, we, we've had some, my financial year ends on the 31st of August, so it literally ends in tomorrow. So um, as usual, my accountant has made absolutely no suggestions at all about how I might mitigate my tax liabilities. And today and tomorrow are the last two days you can do it because uh, obviously you can't, you know, you can't, in, in December or January, you can't retrospectively spend something in a year. Uh, so uh, once again, I'm in the dark in terms of financial advice, financial guidance. I've always said that the accountant is really just a translator. He just translates your accounts into inland revenue speak and that's what you're paying for. I dare say you can get more out of an accountant and some, some accountants do try and deliver more but I've never found one. Um, yeah, so, so you know, I mean, I think when we look at it financially we will be seen to have had a pretty, pretty luckluster year. You know, pretty dismal year I'd say financially. And, uh, which is great, which is great, which <laughs> is what you want, isn't it? You want a lacklustre financial year, don't you? You don't want, uh, you don't want to say, yeah, oh, this year we made a ton of profit, because you'll have to pay a ton of tax. And that's the other, the best accountants are the ones that just keep you barely profitable. Not the ones that, uh, you know, show you making an absolute stonking fortune that the inland revenue is going to want to get their greedy hooks into so if we haven't made a profit and we don't pay any tax this year then i shall be pleased but i mean you know i've kept food on i've kept the roof over my head i've kept food on the plate and uh the but i think the surgery opened in november 20 11 and uh, no, what I'm talking about 2011 uh, 2015 11 11 11 15 11 11 11 um, and so I'm more than halfway through the five-year lease and so we've got this deadline of 11th of November 2020 coming up which is when the lease runs out and then I'll have to decide what to do and I, I I don't think they'll be too unhappy if I just carry on running the, the place on a month-to-month -month basis because it is a business innovation centre and a five-year lease is a, it was a necessary construct to be able to borrow the money over five years. The bank wouldn't lend me the money over, uh, would only lend me the money over the period of the lease. And so a uh, five-year lease meant five-year repayment. 
which was wasn't as long as I wanted. I wanted to repay over a long period, uh, but they the five years was the longest lease I could get because they wouldn't give me a lease over a longest period. So a longer period. So the um, the arrangement eventually became a compromise between the landlord and the bank over over the over, and five years was a sort of middle ground. But, you know, I mean, they rent these desks by the day outside, so I don't see why they shouldn't rent the uh, surgery by the month. You know, or given three months notice or... I mean, people move out of there at a month's notice. They, you know, they really, there's no security of tenure in that place. So, um, and two years is about the time it takes to get your surgery on the market. If you want to sell it, you know, by the time you've contacted a broker, they've done the details, you've sent them all the paperwork they require, they've put it together in a package, they've sent it out to their platinum customers, and then sent it out to their gold customers, and then sent it out to their silver customers, and then their bronze customers, and then and then finally released it, you know, to the general public. Um, Which is not fair in a way, is it really? Because your, um, you know, your surgery deserves the widest audience possible, and by limiting who they release it to initially, they're making themselves some extra money, while at the same time restricting your chances of making a sale. So I have to remember that. I'll have to exercise the right to market it myself generally, and undercut their gold, silver, platinum model. But uh, where was I? Yeah, talking about the, the, the year, you know, the financial year. I mean, we um, we had the reasonably, I think it sort of split into three periods. The first period, the first four months was reasonably successful. We had our implantologist was still working for, with us and uh, income was, was reasonable. And then um, in the middle uh, four months, came to the conclusion that the, uh, the implantologist left in that period, let's put it that way, and went to work in another practice for a very, very short period and then from there, there on uh, didn't, uh, and I was dismissed from that practice in pretty short order. Uh, look at that, that's me 40 years ago, well 30 years ago. All petrol and no brains. Uh, yeah, and um, and then this something still wasn't quite right with the surgery. You know, we still weren't we weren't as busy as we should be. I couldn't understand it. We we're two and a half years into this project, and we still weren't really, really successful. And I've never ever run anything other than a really, really successful dental practice. And I don't uh, and I don't define success by uh, money, you know, a la sort of Paul Mendelssohn type approach, I define it as a number of factors. The main one being how happy I am, <laughs> how happy I am to be doing what I'm doing. And uh, and then other things like how happy the staff are and uh, whether how happy the bank manager is, you know, whether we're making any, uh, you know, we're paying the bills. I've never ever not paid a bill missed a mortgage payment or missed a loan repayment so I mean obviously that's a big part of it um, but um, you know we should have been busier we should have been we probably should have had two dentists here by now we should have had a hygienist working two or three days a week not just one um, and uh, that that unease you know that just that gut feeling from running a surgery for so many years was finally pinned down to the position of reception um, and uh, we felt that the, uh, the the role the reception role was not living up to its promise in terms of uh, delivering on sales and customer satisfaction so we abolished the role of reception and uh, that was very challenging I mean those of you who've sort of listened to these ramblings no already know that we did this oh, sorry junction of death and uh, there you go 
irony of it is, is that uh, we wouldn't even get that on the webcam because it has been coming out every from the side. You'll be the first to see it. Well, you probably wouldn't because I don't think they put it on YouTube. But it's my dying wish. Should I be killed at the junction, the T-junction of death, that the footage be put on YouTube as my final, my final statement. <laughs> well, it's not very funny, is it? Really, no. Anyway, so yeah, so we made the receptionist job redundant, and uh, really haven't looked back, which sounds weird, doesn't it? Because there's me, two part-time nurses, and a hygienist there now, and. When your income is not as high as it needs to be, or should be, of course you should try and improve your income. You know, of course you should try and boost your income. You should be looking to do all sorts of things to try and boost your income. But at the same time, you have to be looking at all sorts of ways to cut your costs. And that's more difficult, isn't it? Nobody wants to cut their costs. Nobody wants to cut, you know, you can't just go to the staff and say, I want you all to take a pay cut, or you can't, you know, can buy cheaper materials to a certain extent but you know your your dental directory bills or whatever your Henry Shine bills are going to be are not going to go down massively and it depends on the discrepancy if you know if it's a few hundred quid every month that you're you're out of kilter then you know that's not too much cause for concern but if you're having to put three five seven thousand pounds in the business as I was uh, on a monthly basis then uh, things aren't right you know the balance isn't right now I'll get that money back because it goes into the director's loan account which at the moment is looking very robust and healthy but um, <clears throat> but of course it's you know cash flow and you don't really want to you know don't you feel as though you're paying to go to work you know um, which is odd really because when you go to a bank and you ask them to to borrow you know and you say oh, I've got this, I want to buy this surgery let's say it costs five hundred thousand pounds I want to buy this surgery and they'll say, okay, yeah, fine, We're, we are lending for dental surgeries at the moment. How much of your own money are you going to put in? And at that point, a lot of dentists say, well, none, actually. I thought I'd use all of your money. <laughs> Either I haven't got any money, or um, I don't feel like using any of my money. You know, I like my money where it is, in my bank account, or in my house, you know. Uh, and of course the bank's not very happy with that. They're like, they like to see, they don't want to take the whole risk. They're not in the, the game of setting up dental surgeries. They're in the game of lending money. And part of being successful in the game of money is getting the money back. A very big part actually. <laughs> so they're not, they don't want you to come to them with a schemes to buy, for them to buy a surgery because they're going to do really well. I mean, at the most, they're going to get their three percent or four percent, and and you'll get you'll get the income, you'll get the lion's share of the profit, um, and they'll just be happy to get their money back. But if you've got a project and you're not willing to put any of your own money in it, then they get a bit funny and do uh, do daft things like refusing to lend you the money. Well, they take that attitude at the beginning of the project. So I don't see why they shouldn't take that attitude in the middle. I mean, if the project is, is not working out as expected, or it's losing money, or you, it needs funding, uh, the cash flow needs funding during a period of fundamental, what the Americans would call a pivot, you know, where you're, you're changing quite, uh, not drastically, but in a significant way, you're changing the gearing, the, 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 the way the surgery is geared up to work. Not the financial gearing, but you know the staffing ratios or the suppliers, the labs, the location, even buying equipment, etc. And you're prepared to put your own money into the, the surgery, to um, because you believe in it so much that you're, you know, you believe that you're going to get the money back, plus the improvements that uh, you're funding. Then I think the bank should respect that. I don't think they should turn then turn around at that point and say, well, this this business is a disaster because you're having to pay to keep it running. Not that they have. I mean, not that they probably even know, but I mean, I don't see why they're, fundamentally there's any difference in those two cases. 
that August has been difficult because um, the uh, we, we've had uh, obviously one of the nurses has been off at any one time so we've had like one part-time nurse pretty much uh, funding uh, pretty much running running the surgery and on the days in the hygienist is in she's having to act as a clinical assistant for two people so that's involved some changes in the booking like for example we didn't have any hygiene appointments booked in yesterday when I was doing a five unit bridge prep um, but you know we've coped we've coped and that's with a small business you can you can cope you know uh, you have to be extremely flexible like for example um, um, one of the, the uh, nurses who was asked to cover for the uh, for the nurse that was off had a holiday booked in not a holiday but a long week but long weekend booked in Liverpool because her boyfriend's from Liverpool and they have like a Beatles weekend up there and so we had to shut on the Friday the Saturday the Sunday and the Monday um, because we had no nurses and but you know I, I'm not I'm like, okay, yeah, go, go to the, have a fun, have fun at your Beatles weekend, you know. Life's too short to be too much of an asshole about giving people the odd day off. Oh, there you go. They're all in there somewhere. So, yeah, so I'll put some notes in my account so the accountant saying, uh, you know, we, we had a we had an implantologist left. That's obviously led to a massive decrease in the turnover, but not necessarily, well, I mean, in the short term, to a decrease in the profits or even a loss. But um, uh, the, the change that that's brought about is now being reflected than that and the loss of the hygienist, uh, the receptionist. Uh, now mean that uh, it's happy days, you know. The surgery is now even working part time. The surgery is, I think, is financially secure. And when we took out the implantologist's income and expenses, which you can do if you've got an accounting program that allocates expenses to an individual practitioner, you can just press a button and take take them out of the equation and see what your profit and loss looks like. And it was quite clear that we, we were gonna have a challenge making up the profit that would, we would lose as a result of the implantologist leaving. But um, I think we're gonna be able to do it. And I think we're gonna be able to do it without actually even doing any implants. So uh, when we do start doing implants, I think that's gonna be the icing on the cake. And we'll, be, we'll be well out of the woods by then. So, if the car sounds a bit quieter, it's because I've had that wheel bearing replaced. It was the front right wheel bearing, which is the one nearest the camera. And uh, apparently I took it to a local garage. Well, we used to take it, the whole thing to a local garage and um, they'd replaced the brake pads and they'd left the brake pads tightened up too much. So that as I drove along, the brake pads heated up the brake disc and that heated up the whole of the wheel assembly and as a result the um, the wheel bearing uh, overheated and failed so totally down as usual my problem is a totally down somebody else is screwing up so needless to say my local garage is not getting the business anymore it's going to the main uh, Peugeot dealer What can I tell you? It's getting a bit autumnal. It's not a flat white cloud anymore. It's more sort of uh, cumulus. I'd say about nine octaves. Not nine octaves. <laughs> Seven octaves. Seven octaves. Sorry. It's a little flying joke. People who can fly will know why nine octaves is funny. Ah dear. Um, yeah, so so no receptionist is going okay, and um, I mean, you know, we get a few emails in the morning, which we deal with, probably two or three. We get uh, after nine o'clock, we tend to get some phone calls, mainly from people asking if we're taking on new patients. They always tend to ring; they never email. So um, we have to have 
you know, take a few phone calls until nine, ten o'clock. The odd emergency, they, they tend to ring about four or five o'clock. Um, but otherwise, you know, not having a receptionist is not a big deal. And funnily enough, the patients sort of adapt, you know, when they know that there's no one on reception, then they tend to use email more, I think, a bit. So, uh, and we do reply quite quickly to the email. And I, you know, I, am, I do have this habit of um, replying to email even if it's like nine o'clock in the evening or 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, you know, because I can get the appointment book up and if people want to change an appointment, it's just a case of drag and drop. And then the, the emails, the confirmation emails sent out automatically. The other thing we're doing is we're changing the phone number. And that's not something you do lightly, but, um, the phone number where I am at the Innovation Centre is tied to the Innovation Centre and it's one of a block of 100 or something or 50 that they have, that they're allocated as a block. And so if we ever wanted to move premises, we'd have to give up our phone number because uh, as far as Ofcom's concerned, it's not my number, I'm just leasing it off of this company and it's their number and so I don't have a right to transfer it even though I am a business. So um, that's something that I really don't want to do, and, but I'm doing it slowly over time and does involve changing obviously a lot of business cards and things like that. But I think it's important that we have a number that's associated with the practice that's portable. Um, and this number is so portable, it's literally on a Vonage box that you can unplug from the internet anywhere in the world and plug it into the internet anywhere in the world and it'll ring as normal anywhere so uh, it's like um, you know if I went on holiday even I could take the Vonage box with me and a phone and just plug it into the internet and and say hello first impressions every time I pick the phone up so and that's great I love that and that's the great thing about technology you know this ability to do things that whenever possible so there you go there's a roundup of where we are at the moment and uh, and although the uh, DFO is technically defunct, I'm still answering questions uh, on an ad hoc basis for people. So uh, by all means, do feel free to contact me. And uh, I hope you have a good day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.